Welcome to Arise Life, a community of believers being equipped, empowered, and released into their destiny. For more information, go to arisealife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You guys ever going through something and you kind of think you're probably going through it because there's something wrong with you? Does that make sense? I mean, that's super general, but like... But then you find out other people are going through something similar and maybe it's not just about you. What happens to your heart at that point? Feels better? Why does your heart feel better when you find out other people are as screwed up as you? (laughs) What? You're You're not alone. You're not alone. I would submit it's also maybe it doesn't mean as bad as you think it does. Right, because a lot of times when we're going through something hard, we a lot of times, who are my people? You think it's it's probably all your fault, or there's something really wrong with you. And it's really, really helpful when we come into a space and what uh, Drew mentioned about the mirror, where I get to hear what you're going through and you get to hear what I'm going through, and suddenly I realize, wow, I'm not as messed up as you. So that's good. No, but, or, or at least we're messed up in similar ways. Or, and I can tell you're pretty awesome. And there's something that happens about living out, the, out of that space. And that's why John tells us, confess your sins where you're falling short. By the way, that's not just immorality or whatever. Anybody here have some places where you feel like your emotional life is falling short? And you don't know why? That's sin. I'm not saying it's you're bad. I'm saying it's not what the best that God had for you. You know? And so a lot of times we suffer because we don't ask. We don't bring it out in the presence of the body. So we're going after something today, and I'm going to dare you to be brave. Because it's real. And your whatever you wherever you are, you will find yourself in what we're going after today. Now, if you guys remember, last week we talked about a really messed up family that could have come from the trailer park down the road in Kentucky. You guys remember the family? Can we pull up their family tree? So there was a, a family that had generation after generation of messed upness. And in particular, generation we're looking at, dad had four wives and a whole bunch of kids, and they didn't like each other. Anybody here from a blended family? So the dynamics were legit. They were messed up. And it's into this place we, we, we met, again, Joseph. So you've got already 10 kids from three different wives, and finally, dad's favorite wife has a kid. And what happens to the the child of the favorite wife? Jumps right to the front of the line. Anybody here had had a younger sibling who didn't have to do anything, who got away with murder? Yeah. Okay, this times 10, right? How do you feel about that younger sibling? You don't like them? Buried them in a hole. (laughs) Could we flip those lights back and forth? I I can't see you guys. And uh, there we go. There we go. Awesome. And and so in that place, it's like, how dare you? You need to suffer like I suffered. You got mom and dad 2.0. They already had figured out how not to parent with me. And now they got you, right? Here's this space, and they don't like him. But he is a younger brother who's not real smart. Any of us been younger brothers who are not real smart? Yeah. You tried to figure out how to push your older brothers and it didn't go well. Anyway, and that's what they did. It said that, that the, the, um, the two, Zilpah and, and Billa, they weren't even full-fledged quote-unquote wives. They were just servants. And they, they're those guys who are on the total outs, didn't, weren't doing their job right, and Joseph tattletailed on them. Mm. In the middle of it said that, that his father gave him this cloak that was like a Gucci suit. It was the stuff, and it showed that he was going to be in charge. How do you think? How do you think? His brothers are 30, 40 years old, and 
He shows up 14, 15 years old wearing the presidential outfit. And on top of that, then he begins to have dreams that he is in fact going to lead his family. He has dreams of his brothers bowing down to him. And he has the genius idea, to, because they're really not getting how they ought to relate to him, he has the genius idea to help them understand that God says they need to bow down to him. And how do you think that goes? Not well. Here, anybody here, God showed you your future and you tried to help it along? How does that work? Not well. Not well. Not well. It sounds like you have some experience. And, uh, and so that's, that's where we're at. And so if we pick up the story, this is Genesis 37. If you have Bibles, break them out. We're not leaving this chapter. You're going to want to see this. And it says, it says, now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. So they're living down in the south of, uh, of Israel in Hebron. And they go all the way about 50 miles north through the hill country, rough country, to an area called Shechem where there's good grass and they're grazing all their sheep and goats and camels and all that. And it says, uh, he, and Israel, that's Jacob, said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing their flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Now, before we get started, anybody here use other people's stupidity as an excuse for you being stupid? They started it, Right? Okay, so they are off out there. And why do you think Jacob is sending Joseph to go see his brothers? What happened the last time he went to go see his brothers? He told on them, right? So what do you think his dad is sending him to do now? I'm just telling you, as a father, you're setting your boy up for failure. Right? Right? He's like, he sends him out. He sends him out to go check on them, right? Whoo! As you know, he said, come, I'm going to send you to them. Now, it doesn't say he's going to check up on him, but what, don't you think that's what the brothers think? He said, so he said to him, he said, go and see if all that is well with my brother and with your brothers and your flock and bring word back to me. He is tatt tattletaling. And then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, traveling 50 miles, a man found him wandering around in the field. <laughs> They're not here. Where did they go? And he replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? And they said, they, he said, they moved on from here. And I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. That's another 15 miles on further north. So Joseph went with his brothers and found them near Dothan. Not Alabama. When, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Now they can see him from a distance, and they know who it is. Why do you think they know who it is? Gucci suit, baby. He's got the strut. He's working it, right? Now, I okay, listen. This is a business trip through a dirty, ugly country. Do you think he needed to wear the business suit? Why do you think he wore the business suit? Huh? Look at me. Look at me. I need you guys to understand I've been delegated. <laughs> Remember that bowing down thing? <clears throat> Man, how? Okay, listen. I have... I didn't grow up in a perfect family. But do you know how bad it is? I, now, my brother and I tried to kill each other a few times. But it was, we never plotted to kill each other. <laughs> Boys, don't you know what I'm talking about? It is possible for men to have a fight and try to kill each other, but with not the intent to kill each other. Does that make sense, men? You know what I'm talking about. But if you're plotting to kill them, that's a whole nother level, right? Woo! Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come, now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns, these empty holes in the ground for water, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him, and then we'll see what comes of his dreams. This went dark fast, didn't it? Wow. What 
in the world. Now, when Reuben heard this, now if you guys remember that family tree, who's Reuben? You get points if you know. First brother. In the ancient world, who was the one who took over the family normally? The firstborn. Who is Joseph pushing out of his position? Firstborn. Reuben heard this and he tried to rescue him from their hand. Let's not do it. Take his life. He said, don't shed there any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. And the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, what? What? Man, it's hard work trying to kill your brother. We should have a meal. Celebrate. Like, they're so super cash about this. I'm just like... As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. And their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Now, Judah said to his brothers, do you know who Judah is? Who, okay, again, you get points. If you remember, who's Judah? He's the fourth born. He's the last of the first bunch of kids born. He's, he's got nothing. He ain't got nothing. Right? But he says to his brothers, and by the way, who is Judah again? Who comes out of Judah's line? This is Jesus' great, 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 great granddaddy. Now listen, if God can do this with Judah, what could he do with you and your family line? Just saying. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. And after all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. Anybody have a problem with the logic here? But it's just saying, anyway, I mean, we, I mean, let's just not have it go to nothing. Let's at least recycle him. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Do you know somebody else related to Judah who got sold for pieces of silver? Who people were supposed to bow down to. When Reuben returned to the cistern, and so they, to the Ishmaelites, they took him to Egypt. And when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy's not there. Where can I go now? Turn now. And then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood. And they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized and he said, it's my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been surely torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, no, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers, officials, the captain of the guard. If we can pull up those maps. So he starts out up in Shechem and Dotham, and he heads up, and they walk for 360 miles, 20 days. Remember, he's been had a pretty cushy life. What do you think is going through his head as he is walking there? As he is walking that distance, he through those twenty miles of uh, through uh, twenty miles a day in the hard terrain, desert, and then he gets to Memphis, not Tennessee. The next map, from there, he's only he's not even halfway there. He's another two months to go by boat, which he might have been pulling that boat as far away from home 
as can be. But if you notice, he had to pass by pretty much his hometown to get there. So let me ask you a question. What do you think was going through Joseph's head? What did I do to deserve? What else? Will I ever see home again? What else? Everyone hates me. Everyone hates me. Oh, revenge. Come on, start planning, right? Count of Monte Cristo style. Yeah, what's that? What's that? My feet hurt. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Pain. By the way, it's probably not just his feet that hurt. It's probably being whipped, abused, starved. What else? Destiny is gone. Destiny is gone. No future. What else? You guys are nice, by the way. Where's my dad? Here's the funny thing is, Joseph doesn't know that Reuben tried to save him. Joseph doesn't know what's happening with his dad. What is he imagining, right? What else? How do I escape? What do you think he's feeling? Confused about his dream. Confused? Like, what, what... How does this relate to my dream? My brothers did not exactly fulfill that, did they? In fact, they did everything to not fulfill it. Why has God forsaken me? Forsaken, abandoned, betrayed. Now, one of the amazing moments um, that if you are suffering at the hands of your brothers, you have a moment when rage gives way to this. What did I, could I have done differently? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Coulda, woulda, shoulda. We see this thing where he is going. He's, he, he's going into a place of fear and confusion about the future. Right? Every step he takes further from home is, is less of a chance he'll ever see home again. Every step he takes away from the people who know him to a people who only see him as a thing. Right? Right? The whole time, I'd be doing Count of Monte Cristo levels, type thinking about revenge, right? I'd be thinking about blame. Whose fault is this? Dad should never have given me that coat. He set me up to fail, right? What's wrong with my dad and all these women? What's up with my brothers? Everybody's fault, everybody's fault, and yet at the same time struggling with Shame. Somehow I think it might be my fault too. And you play in your mind the game of coulda, woulda, shoulda, trying to rewrite history, but it doesn't work, does it? It's trapped in this place of blame and shame and fear. What does that do to you? What is that? Huh? What's that? Question God. Question God? Can't trust God? What else? Hopeless. What else? What? Angry. Angry. Victim. Victim. Helpless. 
loveless. Nobody loves me. I, nobody to love. What else? Bitter. Bitter. Depressed. So, we could go on with this for quite a long time. But in this present moment, am, what am I going to do when I can't trust God, when I'm hopeless, I'm angry, I'm a victim, I'm bitter, loveless, and depressed? What am I going to do? Survive. Survive? Rely on yourself. Rely on yourself? Blame? In a very practical way, what am I going to do? Try to fix it? You are now a slave. You are somebody's possession. You are chained. What can you do to fix it? Right? Nothing. Right? You can try. You fantasize about it. Right? But can you do anything about it? You become powerless and you give up and you and with hopelessness you get to a point of very little hope. Do you know what a slave hopes for? What do you think a slave? For instance, in chattel slavery of African Americans in America, what do you think a slave dreamed of? Freedom? Death? Death? Escape? A lot of times dreamed of a day without a beating, right? I don't even dream of plus, I just zero. Dream of a little bit extra food, not a lot. His dreams become incredibly small. What did he get in trouble for? Being what kind of person? A dreamer. What size are his dreams now? Tiny, right? I have no dreams left. And when I have no dreams left, do you know what I do? Survive. Yeah. We've said this before. If my goal is to survive, I'm probably not going to survive. Right. And in that place of pain and hopelessness and despair, what am I going to do? You know, one of the amazing things about, you know, looking at Harriet Tubman as she was leading slaves to freedom, she had a hard time convincing people to flee. Why? Because they couldn't dream. And because they believed that's all they were. Yeah. Joseph is utterly powerless. I'm just going to tell you, for me, if I was Joseph, you know what I would do when I got there? Standing on the block as they're selling me as a piece of meat? What do you think I'm going to be thinking about my master? Hate him, right? What do you think I'm going to be planning to do when I get there? Escape? You are now all, literally up the river. Desert on all sides. You have to travel through a civilization of a language you do not speak, of a people who don't look like you. You're up a river. What do you do? You can't, you're, you hate him, you want to escape, what, how would you work for that master? As little as possible? As little as possible? What's that? Begrudgingly? Begrudgingly? Same thing. Let's watch Joseph. Chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him into with from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So he's one of the most powerful people in the kingdom of Egypt, which is the most powerful nation on earth. And it said, the Lord was with Joseph. What? What? How? How? The what? What? Have you said what? Let me just tell you. There is nothing in the prophecies over Joseph's life that involve Egypt or being a prime minister. I'm going to submit to you that God can even take the worst things that have been done to you and turn them to you or good. 
and even for your promotion. God was like, I just was planning for you to lead your family. But they got so wicked in it, we're going to have to up the ante. <laughs> Suddenly, he's ruler of the world. Like what? This is what he means when everything, he says that everything, I believe that all things, all things, all things can be turned to my good for those who love God, trust God, and allow him to rewrite the story. Let me tell you this. If Joseph is depending on himself, man, do you think it might be hard for him to see the favor of the Lord in this situation? said, the Lord was with Pharaoh, Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. Why? Let me ask you a question, really practical. How is that favored, do you think? Good food? I'm, I'm trying. Maybe not as much treated as a slave. You know, in the, in, again... With African-American slavery, what you had was you had house slaves and you had field slaves. House slaves were treated more like human beings, less like animals. But do you know what? I'm not going to see the favor of the Lord, am I? In my bitterness and my inability to trust said he was with him. And when the master saw that the Lord was with him. Okay, guys. How do you think the master saw God was with Joseph? He's a pagan. What would be the signs that God was with Joseph to the master? I'm just asking you to guess. There won't be a test. What could be the signs that your boss would know God was with you. People listen to you? You're successful? Attitude? I don't know about y'all. I can't think of anything more supernatural than having a good attitude at this point. Like that's walking on water. True? True? I mean, everybody else is just an animal. They're just a thing. They're just an object. They're just a piece of machinery to be used. And here's Joseph doing something fundamentally different. I need you to keep this in the back of your mind. How does he do that? How does he get to this place? The Lord was, he said, when the master saw this, he said, he uh, gave him success. Joseph found favor in his eyes. And became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household. And he entrusted him to his care everything he owned. From that time on, he put, in him, put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned. And the Lord blessed the, the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. Okay, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who's getting blessed here? Anybody have a problem? Now, I... Y'all are nice. I'm Joseph. I have a list of blessings, and none of them involve Potiphar. Right? I have a list of expected, desired blessings. None of them are about his good or his welfare. He's the guy who bought me. He's the guy... Y'all are nice. And then suddenly Potiphar is being blessed and blessed and blessed. What do you think might we tempt, what temptation might Joseph have at this point towards Potiphar? Manipulate him? Do you think he feels valued by Potiphar? If you really value me, why don't you set me free? If you really see my value, you're just using me. How does he manage his heart so that he actually shows up and the favor of God is visible on his life? How does he manage his heart that what Potiphar is doing and using him doesn't turn his heart? Because watch what happens. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. He was fine. 
And after a while, his master's wife took notice of him and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. Listen to this. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife, in case you're curious why. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now I'm going to tell you something. David was king. And he saw Bathsheba. And he took her for himself. And had no problem with it. And yet Joseph doesn't take what's offered. How does he get there? How does he walk with a heart that is not tempted? Well, tempted. He's human. But temptation, Jesus was tempted. But he doesn't give in to temptation. In fact, recognizes that doing so, I mean, listen. He's been used. He's been abused. He has no future. He has no hope. He has no, nothing waiting for him. Who here would be tempted to take a little fun on the side? Two of us. Three of us? I'll wait. I mean, seriously, who here? You get tired of waiting. He doesn't have any dreams anymore, does he? What's the point? What's the point? Might as well eat, drink, tomorrow we die. And yet, what does he say? How could I sin against God? Don't, how do you still trust him, Joseph? How do you still have hope? When literally your dreams are impossible at this point. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was around. Guys, that's called dumb. Just saying. If you have had this woman after you for days on days on end, that's called dumb. Just saying, putting it out there. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servant and said, look, she said said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until her master his master came home then she told him this story the hebrew slave had brought when the master heard the story of his wife told him saying this is how your slave treated me he burned with anger joseph's master took him and put him in prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined stop for a minute joseph did the right thing right how is he rewarded prison what does that make you feel injustice Uh, uh, injustice, what doing good is the wrong thing that's the last time i trust god true interesting thing is too is There's a sign here that the husband does not believe his wife. You know why? Because by law, he should have killed him. But not only that, he sends him to the ultimate white collar prison where they have tennis courts in the back, you know? You know, I mean, you know? No, seriously, he sends him to the prisoner, the, 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 the prison that was most likely in under the king's throne room where they put... You know, the, 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 king, the pharaoh would be like, I hate you. Drag him off, put him in there. Where's Bubba again? They drag him back out, right? Like literally, it was just like that was that kind of a prison. It was, it was the king, pharaoh's private little prison. And so, like I said, they ha- it, was as, it was as good as it gets prison style. Now, let me ask you this. Can you imagine someone trying to encourage you on that first day in prison? Joseph, congratulations. You made it. You did it. You got the best prison of all. What do you want to say to that person? You want to knock them out. You're like, no! 
I was favored son. Then I was slave. Now I'm a prisoner. Let me start again. How in the world does he show up and still care? Why, how does he show up and still trust God? How does he do this when all of his hopes, all of his dreams, had none of them have turned out the way he expected at all? But it says this. It said, while Joseph was there in prison. Okay. What do you, okay, you're in prison now. What do you do? You Doing the good gets you the wrong things. But what do you do now? Organized criminal activity. She, you want to be with Masha. She'll, she'll take care of you. She'll look out for you. She'll be running the gang. All right. Yeah. Go to the other extreme, right? Okay. What some, you guys, you were way too good. Give me some options here. What do you want to do? If you have done the good and all it's gotten you is pain, what do you want to do? What's that? Rebel? What's that? Do nothing? Break out? Conspire? What's that? I'm going to be bad. What I hear is basically be bad or do nothing. Who are my lay down and die people? Right? You know, like I know that if I try to break out, they're probably going to kill me. I don't want that. I don't want, I, I, can I do worse than prison? Right? Yeah, you can go to a worse prison. Oh, right? At this point, all of the blame. So who do you think he's blaming at this point? God. Who else? Potiphar. Potiphar? His wife? His wife? Potiphar, you trust me everything. You know she's lying. You know Potiphar's going, dude. I don't know what to say. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> right? His dad still, my brothers. I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the brothers. Do you think he might be tempted to keep this rolling Rolodex of blame in his head? But who, who here thinks he also might have been thinking, dude, I was an idiot. I knew I shouldn't have gone in that house that day. Or maybe he thought he could do what the parents thought. Oh, mm-hmm. Dude, I mean, who would have known? I should have done it. Truth. And yet, we see somebody different. It said, but while Joseph was there in prison, by the word, the best word in the Bible after Jesus is but, because it means he changes everything. But while Jesus, uh, Joseph was in prison, the Lord was. Anybody found that God has a strange way of being with you? Have you noticed every time you're freaking out, God says, fear not because I am with you. Maybe that's the problem. Because. <laughs> You're doing this to me. Why do you hate me? But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness. Okay. If you're in prison and God said, I'm going to show you kindness, what kind of kindness are you looking for? To get out. To get get home. See Potiphar's wife brought in on charges. See, your brothers brought in on charges, right? Do you remember I said this, that the Garden of Eden, the sin that sets us apart from God, separates us from God, is I will determine what is good to me in my life. The tree of the knowledge of good. I am the one. who. I don't know about you, but I don't see a problem. Getting out of prison seems like a good deal. Getting out of slavery seems like a good deal. Like, I don't see why would that not be good. Anybody here thought you knew what was good for you, but when you got it, it screwed you up? Yeah. See, see, we, it's not just that it's not good or bad. It's me determining it's good for me now, how I want it now. It's not trusting God. God was with him. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. 
Anybody feel like this is Groundhog Day? <laughs> like, I, this is not the promotional plan I had in mind. You know, he's plotting out his dream. Anybody have like a dream board? And you're like, I'm just seeing slavery and then prison. You know, this is how it's going to work. By the way, it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due season, he will lift you up. That's okay, God. I can help. Anybody here would have mapped that out as your plan? <laughs> See, God will eat. See, he says this later. He says to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God reintended for good. God didn't even need, he, he will take what the devil throws at you. He will take what people will do to you. He will take betrayal. He will take slander. He will take the things that God never wanted for you, but he'll even use those to bring you into what he promised. If I will trust him. If I will trust him and not choose for myself the good. Self-protection, self-promotion. And it said, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph, gave him success in whatever he did, but also because the warden could see the fruit of the Spirit on his life, yeah. the integrity, the honesty. Yeah? yeah? Does that mean we surrender to our No, that's a good question. The question was, so do we surrender to our circumstances? No, that's Buddhism. We surrender to a person. We surrender to a person. Do you know how much courage and bravery it was that first day when Joseph shows up and he is a thing. He is an object. How vulnerable and alone he must have felt. Maybe nobody even spoke Hebrew in his area. And here he is. He's standing there. May, probably just wearing a loincloth. And he stands there and he goes, how brave was it to say, God, I will serve Potiphar for you. God, I will serve him. I'm not going to serve for his pleasure. I'm going to serve for him, for you, Lord. I'm going to trust you. I don't see how anything good can come out of the circumstances, but I will trust you. But stay, stay with me. You know how you have to get there? First, you have to be honest about how bad it is. Anybody here known somebody who just like, everything's fine? You're like not dealing with reality and you can smell the bitterness seeping out of their pores. Yeah. Mm -mm. God, I am hurt. I am angry. I expected this and this is what happened. God, what do you want me to know about this? I will be with you. Trust me. Walk with me. I'm hurting. I feel like you let me down. I, you can trust me. Walk with me. Being honest, being open, being raw, being vulnerable. This is what grief is. It says it's not okay. They should be here. This should have happened this way. It didn't. Not making up our story of blame and shame. Because here's the deal. Is by letting go of the blame and the shame and my attempts to control the future, I am now able to say yes to Jesus in this present moment. Yes. I, he couldn't know. He didn't know Egyptian. He didn't know the plan. He didn't know Pharaoh's court. He could not have figured out how. But God, by submitting to God, saying, God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? Walking with him in this act of surrender, saying, I am no longer the arbiter of what is good in my life. You alone know what is good for me, and I'm going to trust you. Not that what's coming to me is good, but I trust you to make it good as I walk and surrender before you. Part of grief is letting go of what I did, trying to make things good. Part of grief is letting go of the people who put me there, who failed me, or did things to me. Letting go of the fantasies I have for controlling everything.
Uh, I was struggling um, really bad with grief about a week ago about a situation. And I started to play coulda, woulda, shoulda. Started to figure out who's to blame. I started to figure out what I could have done differently, what they did or what I I started doing that. And then I started thinking about how is this all going to plan out? Who are my people? You know, I mapped it out. I looked like that crazy guy, you know, on the meme who's doing the conspiracy theory. Like I was like, ah, and this is going to happen. Pretty soon, by the way, everybody had died in a nuclear apocalypse. Like, you know, anybody been on that slip and slide where you just get there so fast? And I'm sitting in that place, and I am hurting so bad. But I was like, God, God, what do you, oh. I, and God's like, are you going to take your medicine and do what you tell everybody else to do? I was like, ah, okay, fine, God, what are you going to do about this? He said, wrong question. Because I'm already in the future. I'm asking what he's going to do about this. He said, uh-uh, uh-uh. I said, well, God, what are you going to do about them? <laughs> He's like, Wrong question. And, and I said, but God, we got to solve this. We got to do this. If we don't, ah. Uh. And God just said this. He said, Peter, you ever heard of one of those drug addicts who gave their life to me and were utterly transformed in that moment? I was like, yeah, what does that have to do with anything? He said, imagine if I can do turn their life around in a moment, what I could do in your life in this moment. Wow. Not the future. Not the past. This moment is all I have to give God. This moment is the only place God will meet me. He won't meet me in the past. He won't meet me in the future. He said, I said, okay, fine. What do you want me to know about all this? He said, give it to me. Give them to me. Give it to me. Give me the future. Give me the past. Give me your shame. Give me your sin. Give me what was done to you. Give it to me. And I was like, I said, okay. I said, okay. What do you want me to know? And he said, it's going to be okay. I didn't ask for a Hallmark card. (laughs) But what I did in that moment is I stayed in the middle of the raging pain. And you ever had this where you're standing in a shower, you get in, it's really, really hot. And then after a bit, it's so cold because you've gotten used to it that you turn it up hotter. What I realized was he had already taken the sharpness out of the pain. He took the fear out of the pain. He took the rage out of the pain. Still hurt, Mm -hmm. but I was okay. And I said, I think there's more in there. And he said, sure. And he brought up more and more. As I gave it to him, he took away. See, here's the deal. Walking with Jesus doesn't mean you don't get hurt. It just means you end up with healed scars like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if I am a slave to the past or the future, I will never be able to partner with him in the moment. And I will die a slave in Potiphar's house. Or I will die a prisoner in Pharaoh's basement. But if I'll say yes to him, he can today begin to restore what, the, what, the, what has been stolen from me. I love something that Christoph said on our men's weekend. I know we're not supposed to talk about it, but I'm going to let this one out of the bag. He said this thing. He said, I've discovered that restoration is not getting back what was stolen from you, but God giving you something in its place that's far better. But I have to let go of that what I wanted, what I thought, what was. I have to let it go so that God can give me something better because it's going to come by a way I never expected. But only if I surrender and say, God, I'm not not legal to determine what is good in my life. I don't see how me being in prison is an upgrade. But I don't get to make those kind of decisions. God, how do you want to meet me here? How do you want to empower me here? How am I going to show up in integrity and joy? That man, he, he lied about me. How can you use them lying about me for my good? I don't see how that's possible, but that's not my job. God, I trust you. Come, do your work in me. God, I don't see how you're moving. You're going to use this for my good, but that's not my job. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. So the end, we see him lifted up into a place 
where he's in this in the middle of the prison, he is interpreting dreams for Pharaoh's attendants, the baker and the cupbearer. And he's later asked, how do you do? He said, you know, interpretation comes from the Lord. Not from me. He's still humble. He's still able to hear God's voice in the middle of the prison. He doesn't, he's not at playing this game. If I leave the prison, I will trust you. He says, even, even in this prison, I will trust you. Even if the baker and the steward, they forget me, I will remember you. And when the moment in due season, God lifts him up before Pharaoh, guess what? Pharaoh in a moment, so just like Potiphar, just like the warden of the prison, recognizes the favor of God so much on his life. You got to understand this. This would be as if the president of the United States looked at you, you, and said, because you lead all of our armies. It's that insane. But he looks at a guy who's been sitting in his basement, he's never laid eyes on before, and goes, why don't you lead our country? Because the glory of God is so evident in his life in prison. We say, only if I am up here will people understand my value. I, only then can God use me. Only then will I partner with God. Only then can I trust him. He says, no, I will shine so bright in the darkness that all the world will come to know him. If we could have the worship team come up. I don't know where you are in all of this. I don't know where you're stuck. I don't know if you're in Potiphar's house or you're in a prison or you're in a cistern thrown by your, your brothers or you're being set up by your dad with the cloak or you have set up in a family with multiple wives. I don't know where you're at, but I promise you this. You, you have areas where you are enslaved to blame and shame or you're enslaved to fear of the future and God is calling you to this present moment. Will you let go of those things and meet him in this present moment? In this present moment, God will transform all things if you and I will surrender those things to him and say, not my will, but yours be done. We can stand. You know... I just saw this so clearly. Many of us are enslaved to this idea. It will be good when. When this happens, it will be good. And so we're not able to live in this present moment. And God says, give me that future. Give me that future good. Surrender it to me. Or... God, you can't do anything in my life because of this person. Give them to me. I will be with you. I will pour out my favor upon you. And I will guide you in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. And it will be good. It will be good. But in leading you in those paths, I might lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. But fear no evil, because I am with you. I lay down my plan, my vision board, my, my <laughs> everything. My who did what, I lay it down. And I say, God, you are my champion. You are the one who delivers me. And so I will say yes to you right now, in this moment. And in the next moment. You will meet me. You will empower me with your Holy Spirit to walk the walk you have for me that will transform trials into gold, that will transform what the enemy has done to me into good. But not my will, but yours be done. I'm not going to lay down and die and just take my circumstances. I will rise up and obey. I will rise up and believe. Lord, we love you. We worship you. For more information, go to AriseLife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.